All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jody Brooms. I'm a Leadership and Civic Engagement Specialist with NDSU Extension. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Andrea Bowman. I work for NDSU Extension in the area of Leadership and Civic Engagement also. And today we're going to um, continue our discussion on some topics we talk about in Lead Local. And last time we talked about ethical leadership and today we're gonna move into effective meetings. Great, and so um, this, this section, um, we do some, we practice typically some parliamentary procedure and talk about why that's important, um, but with um, more people, workforce working um, remotely, um, many groups have gone to having um, remote meetings. And um, ironically on the um, Attorney General's website, it, there is a statement about, if you don't have to have the meeting, don't have it, um, rethink, having those meetings and you know that's something Andrew and I talk about too when we we work with lead local groups we talk about you know don't meet just to meet because you typically have a monthly meeting scheduled for your whatever particular group it might be if you have no business on the agenda then don't call a meeting um, you know our state it's um, documented that we need between eight and nine thousand volunteers to serve on your maybe it's your school council um, school board or your church council or um, running for legislature um, because so there's a lot of positions to fill and so let's not fill that time with unnecessary meetings because people it's it's a proven fact people don't want to have to attend any more meetings than they have to so the meetings that you do hold make sure they're effective yeah and effective meetings is really about uh, good time management um, and it takes some planning ahead of time to have everything in place. And with our recent shift to more online and virtual formats, uh, they've kind of forced us to maybe be a little more organized and have that information out to board members ahead of time. And remote meetings can really be um, just as effective, if not even more effective, than um, our regular organizational meetings. And so that's what we're going to dive into a little bit more today and look at those um, different layers of effective meetings. Um, last time we talked about the laws, the open record and meeting laws, and how they apply to organizations. So today we'll dive into a little bit more of the parliamentary procedure and just the best practices for transparency in organizations. So in regards to remote meetings, um, choose a format that's available to everyone, either online or on the phone. Um, allow for a practice run or tutorial for board members. Um, and I've seen a lot of this. Um, many counties or your, your county commission, um, I see emails come from county auditors with a Zoom link so people can join um, over the internet or are also provided with a phone number. So if they don't have access to to the internet or choose not to log in, they at least can call in. And so that's um, you know, allowing people to join. You don't want to exclude anyone, especially in those public meetings. Yeah, and I think it's important to be um, very uh, aware of your uh, comfort level of the board members and their technology. Some people aren't as comfortable with the technology, so they might need a little extra help in just um, practicing ahead of time so that when it comes to the actual meeting, it's not the first time they've been in that online format. They have some familiarity of where the different functions are and what they can utilize. So primarily we have used Zoom um, as a platform for the meetings we have been a part of, um, but I know Andrea, you've been a part of Microsoft Teams? Yep, I've been on a few meetings via Teams. And there's certainly others, so we're not necessarily promoting one over the other, um, but I think it's really important to be familiar with it. Um, and, and we've done that just by diving in, um, getting those accounts set up and, and participating in those meetings. And that's really the best way to do it. Make sure you're familiar with it, at least with the ins and outs of that. Um, mm -hmm. Chat functions can only um, be used if everyone can see that chat. So, you know, that's a lesson learned too. Uh, make sure your chat pod is open and people know how to type a question if they don't want to be heard. Right, and we have to, when we're um, in a remote meeting, we have to remember that there might be people that have just called in 
So have to kind of look at things from their perspective too, that they're only hearing what's happening during the meeting. So make sure that we're um, aware of that. So if you are using the chat function, someone would have to read those chats. So depending on um, what the meeting is, if it's an official business of an entity that um, has to um, follow the open record and meeting laws, it's just a good practice to not even use the chat. Or if it's a, just an a informal meeting um, between colleagues or something, then the chat function can be a, a good tool to utilize. So um, effective remote meetings are no different in that um, it's, it's always good to start with your, maybe it's your Pledge of Allegiance or your typical opening ceremonies. Don't disregard those just because you're working remotely. It's always good to start with some kind of introduction or an icebreaker. Um, or I've heard it called um, like a check-in. Make sure everyone gets an opportunity to unmute and not just join via their, um, their video, um, but make sure that people have an opportunity to unmute and participate in the call. So if you do some kind of check-in or an icebreaker, then everyone is required to at least unmute their phone one time. So don't disregard those um, opening ceremonies and some of those traditional things that you do just because you're meeting remotely. Right, we want the meeting to, to look um, the same as it would if you were in, in your uh, typical building that you or meeting room you would meet in, um, but we understand that the format has to be a little different right now. And so that applies to the ground rules, ground rules as well. I mean, hopefully your organization has some established ground rules, and there might be a few more that you need to add that will reply apply to the remote meeting um, and one of those is probably muting your microphone you know what's your policy on that if you're not speaking is your microphone muted um, the other is is your video on do you have video capability um, it's really nice to be able to see people that's one thing that's a little different in remote meetings is you can't necessarily see everybody at the same time depending on the format you're using so it's a little different um, in communicating. You can't always read body language like you, you can in a room. But those ground rules are still really important. And you still really want to use parliamentary procedure. It's really, really important even when it comes to remote meetings. Um, the chair just maybe has to do things a little bit differently. There can be a slight delay in the, rig the video and the sound coming through. So just move things a little bit slower. You know, maybe make sure you're asking for debate a couple more times and making it clear when um, a motion is made and seconded. Might be a good idea too, just to have um, maybe your auditor or your business manager or whoever, maybe your VP, keep an eye on the chat pod. Um, I know sometimes that's, that's, it's hard to pay attention to what you're presenting and manage the chat pod or people have questions. So we want to make sure that you um, are recognizing those things that come up during the meeting. Um, again, just some things about um, establishing some ground rules. Um, I noticed that on Zoom now, a passcode is, is automatically generated. So um, just to maintain um, the meeting, the meeting integrity, so not everyone can, um, like just random people could log on. So that's a that's a default on Zoom now is um, a passcode. So make sure that you share that with with the public who might want to log in. Um, just make sure everyone can participate. As Andrea stated before, make sure you do have an agenda. Um, we're always surprised at how many organizations don't create an agenda before the meeting. Um, and, and now it's no different. It's important for people to look ahead and find out what do I have to prepare for the meeting. Um, this is also important to start and stop on time if you have an hour meeting planned. You know, be, be respectful of people's times. Um, and know with parliamentary procedure, um, that's, that's how you stop people from monopolizing discussion, okay? And that's when an effective chairperson um, is so important to maintain that kind of discussion and where everyone is heard. And, and again, that's why we use Parley Pro, so the minority can be heard. Anything else, Andrea, on ground rules? 
I think that that covers it. I think it's just important to make sure that everybody knows what the ground rules are. And uh, when you're switching to remote formats, maybe go over them again at the beginning of the meeting, just as a refresher and ask if anyone has any additions to be made. Just so, so communication is clear and expectations are known. Excellent point. Just a few so things about agendas. Go ahead, Andrea. Sorry. No. Um, Jody mentioned agendas, and they're really the same when it um, comes to remote meetings. But uh, if it's a, a public entity, you're going to have this agenda posted ahead of time, and so that everybody knows what's on the agenda. Um, if you can, uh, especially to the board members, send out any supporting documents ahead of time. We spend a lot of time in lead local visiting with groups um, about how we can can make their meetings more effective. And one of them is shortening the amount of time that is spent on reports at meetings. So if those reports can be sent out ahead of time for people to review and the minutes from previous meetings, and people have the time to look at them ahead of time, then they can ask questions either before or during the meeting and any additions can be made, but it does save time um, from just all of the reports being given orally during the meeting. Another time-saving um, tip that I've heard of groups doing that have had um, kind of a history of having too long of meetings is to put some kind of um, time limit on a particular topic. So maybe if it's new business, they limit that to 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it might be, um, just so people are aware that they're, they can monopolize the conversation and um, they aren't coming to the meeting with an agenda. Just some things to keep in mind. So again, some agenda items just in regards to Robert's rules of order. Make sure that um, you know your, your chairperson is calling the meeting to order as they typically would in the other meeting. Again, your opening exercises that might be your pledge of allegiance or whatever your organization typically does. Um, you know those things don't need to change just because you're meeting remotely. Make sure you maintain the integrity of your organization and, and the meetings. Um, stick to the reports of officers and standing committees. Um, you know, your special committee reports. We talked about this last time on ethical meetings. Make sure even those special committees that you've appointed to maybe do research or um, study a particular topic, that those um, groups are also abiding by the open meetings and record laws. Um, unfinished business is obviously something that um, perhaps was not settled at the last meeting, perhaps an issue was tabled, um, and then your new business announcements and adjournment. Yeah, and to talk about parliamentary procedure a little bit more without um, spending a, a long a time on it, um, you know, most organizations use it and it's important to use a proven set of rules. Um, there are some other things out there that you can utilize as well. Um, but parliamentary procedure can really help you maintain order um, and helps control the communication process. And just um, like Jody said earlier, it gives a chance for the minority to be heard um, and just keeps the meeting flowing. Um, and a good chairperson in a board that knows parliamentary procedure really helps um, with those effective meetings. And there's some resources there where you can go. We also have a couple of books that we utilize um, in Lead Local to reference if there's any questions on certain items in parliamentary procedure. And we know we have an election coming up here on June 9th, so there might be some changeover in some boards. So when you, another important uh, part of parliamentary procedure is making sure all of your board members have a general understanding of what basic parliamentary procedure is. In, uh, what you need to do to make a motion. Um, so you're saying, I move um, to whatever um, your wishes are for the organization. Um, and, you know, take some time to educate them and give them some resources on, on ways to properly use parliamentary procedure. Um, in our lead local class, we actually do a little fun exercise where we make parliament we make trail mix using parliamentary procedure and it's just kind of a fun way to um, practice parliamentary procedure in a laid-back setting. 
We'll see on the evaluation from lead local. Um, it seems like the, the number one issue people want to learn more about is parliamentary procedure. And it can be daunting, that's for sure. Um, and most organizations don't get real deep into Parley Pro, and we, we fully expect that. But if you want to learn more about it, I mean, even the basics of making a motion, just like what Andrea had said, um, you know, it's important. It's important that you have, that you maintain some control in a meeting. Um, and Extension has a number of resources that are listed on this slide. Um, I know both of us, whenever we go to this training or go to meetings, we bring along our Robert's Rules of Order book. I have a, an abridged version. It's really small, but it has the important points in it. Um, we also have um, tips. We have bookmarks. I'm not sure if that'll show up, but um, so there's just a little pocket guide on tips for leading an effective meeting on one side and the other side is tips for participating in effective meeting. So um, just some, I guess, basic things that happen, um, how to use a gavel, what those series of taps mean, um, making a motion, what privileged motions and incidental motions mean, um, how to make an amendment, tabling a motion. So just really basic things. Um, we see a lot of, um, I would say, just some, as we have learned this more, um, we know enough to be dangerous. And so, like Andrea said, making a simple motion is not, um, I make a motion, it's, Madam President, wait to be recognized, and then I move to whatever the motion may be. So, um, you know, it's important that you have a basic understanding if you're going to participate in a meeting. And, and I know just based on what people have said, they, they won't run for office or they won't be part of an organization because they don't know the basics of parliamentary procedure. And we don't want that to be a prohibiting factor why you're being, why you, why you won't get involved in organizations because our communities need you more than ever. Definitely. And when we look at parliamentary procedure as it applies to remote meetings, um, some things that we look at maybe a little differently is just announcing who you are when you make the motion. Because um, depending on, on the format used, everyone might not know who is talking. So you can say, you know, this is Andrea. I move that we uh, reschedule our next meeting until July 1st. Um, same with the seconds, and it's just a courtesy to whoever's taking minutes for the meeting, too, so they can clearly follow what's happening. Um, and then when you're voting, um, you know, there's different ways to vote, and lots of times our organizations are using a voice vote. Uh, when you're doing a remote meeting, uh, roll call voting is, is probably best because that tells everyone that all of the board members did vote. You know, you can't look and see necessarily that someone said yes or no. Um, so if you do that roll call vote um, in a remote meeting, it's an easy way to track that everybody is still there. They're still engaged in the meeting. And then those that are just listening know how the vote went as well. So a couple things about um, quorum might be familiar with that term. So the minimum number of members that must be present at a meeting to make a valid decision by the organization it's really indicated by the bylaws of the organization. It's typically half of the registered membership. Um, but if you have a constitution in your particular organization, follow that. I mean, you, if you have 10 members, you typically need five at the meeting or whatever half is. Um, it's just the way you can't do, you're not supposed to do business if you don't have quorum for a meeting. Just keep that in mind. It's just so two people aren't making all of their decisions for an organization. So we have a number of references we can share with you. Um, just some of the things that we use when we do this. Um, so I just want to point out a couple of things. So Andrew and I talked about some of the, the questions that we get in regards to meetings, some of the probably more common questions asked. And I'm just going to reference some of the things we, resources we have in our lead local binder. So as Andrea talked about making a proper motion. Um, so Andrea, let me ask you, if I make a motion, um, do you have to agree with the main motion if you second it? 
You don't. If you second the motion, you're just saying, yes, I think that we as a board need to discuss this. So just because you second the motion doesn't mean you are going to vote for the motion or in favor of it. It just means that you want to the board the, to have the opportunity to debate and discuss the motion. It's probably the number one issue that we see in meetings and people tell us to. They usually discuss things and then they vote on it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really the incorrect way to do this. You're supposed to make a motion, second it, and then have the discussion on a particular issue, right? Definitely, that's probably the, the number one um, thing that comes up in early local meetings as far as parliamentary procedure um, that, that isn't done correctly. And it's, it's for whatever reason become common practice um, that we discuss before a motion is made. So, okay, so let's say I make a second, we're having some discussion on it. Um, and then, so that means that, so we've had some discussion and maybe I've changed my mind. So we go to vote just because I've made the second, I don't have to vote on it, right? Correct, you don't have to vote in favor for the motion. Great, okay. So what happens if no one seconds the motion? Mm -hmm. Then the motion just dies for lack of second. Um, you know the the chair will just say, you know, motion dies for lack of second. Right. Okay. So what does question or call for the question mean? And I hear this at meetings often. After some debate, someone will go question. Is that and correct? That, and what does that mean? That means that you're ready to vote. You know, you felt that there's been enough discussion on the matter and that it's time to vote. And so a board, a board member can call for the question. And that just means that they're ready to vote. It is not a motion, but a method of indicating to the chair and the membership that the member is ready to vote. Um, and so at that point, the chair should ask if there's any further discussion just to make sure that everybody's done debating. Correct, because in, par in proper parliamentary procedure, um, the chair will ask for discussion three times before a motion can be voted on. Um, you know, and typically they'll ask for discussion. Someone will, will, will speak up about something. Um, and then, you know, if, if no one else has anything to say, they'll call for discussion to at least two more times. So that it has been called for three times before they take that vote. Um, and that's something that, you know, controlling discussion might be something that you talk about in your ground rules, like that, you know, people can only talk so many times about a certain thing or for so long. And there are actually guidelines in parliamentary procedure on debate. Right. And, you know, that's that authority comes into play um, really when um, you have a good chairperson to control that debate. Um, but they do have the authority under Robert's rules to limit the debate. So the chairperson could say, all right, so um, John can speak again after everyone else has had the opportunity to be heard one time. And then they can go back to John or whomever is kind of uh, monopolizing the discussion. But that is a point of order in um, parliamentary procedure. Yeah, and that's a good point. And a real effective um, chairperson, too, I think does a good job of recognizing somebody that hasn't um, spoken up and will even just ask them if they have anything to add to the conversation. You know, and that comes back to the best practices. You know, it's not necessarily part of parliamentary procedure. It's not the chair's job to ask every single person what they think. But right. I, I think an effective chair can kind of read the room. And that's a little harder on a remote meeting. But but it can be done too, you know, you have, we haven't heard from someone for a while, maybe you just need to check in and say, hey, are you still connected? Does your microphone still work? Just making sure you're still there. Um, or, you know, we haven't heard from you for a while. What are your thoughts? Good point, good point. You know, and it's really important, um, the responsibility is up to board members to participate um, and to be heard, and so, during a meeting is not a time to sit on your hands and hope things work out for the best. Right. And effective meetings, um, you know, they take prep work by everybody. You know, the chair, the people organizing the meetings, but also the board members. To be, to have effective meetings, you need to be an effective board member and do your homework ahead of time and 
um, you know, ask as many questions before the meeting um, as you can. And sometimes the questions come up during the meeting and during discussion that you didn't think of, and that's fine. But I think it's only fair to um, the people that are in charge of, of gathering the resources to ask questions in advance so they have time to research them as well. And then it, it, it's um, nice when, you know, the if there's questions that have been asked ahead of time, maybe bring those up at the meeting because other people might have had those questions as well. Um, so, so that information is shared too. Yeah, great point. Great point. So um, I guess just to close, um, know that we have a number of resources for you as a board member or an organization that um, would like to follow parliamentary procedure or learn more about it. Um, again, we have um, in our lead local, we have a number of resources included in this on um, privileged motions, subsidiary motions, um, and incidental motions and how to handle all of that. And as well as our bookmarks, if your organization would like some of these, we can sure get you some of these bookmarks to share. Um, and keep in mind that um, most organizations are not going to go um, deep into the um, finer points of parliamentary procedure, but even having a basic understanding gives everyone a right to be heard. So it is um, suggested that you have a basic understanding for those things. And we are willing to help with that if you just um, have some questions about that. Mm -hmm.